Thank you. Thank you. All right. So am I talking in this? You can hear me? But I should talk in this for them. This is for you. This is for them. And this is to advance. All right. Very good. Good morning. Eileen Zweifak. Um, just a little bit of background about myself. Lancaster girl, born and raised. Graduated from nursing school. Thanks, Deb. Graduated from nursing school in 1967. My training was at St. Joe. Um, worked at St. Joe in the general for probably about 15 years. Wound up at Hershey Foods, spent 25 years there. I have been a first aid CPR instructor since 1992. It's a long time. So what I bring to you, when I bring these presentations to you, it is part what I have been trained to do along the way, but some of it is my life experience as well. So what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about strokes. Um, I call it Stroke 101 because I feel like I need to educate you from the bottom up. So that's what we're going to do. First of all, what I want to tell you is before I start this, I want to give you a little bit of a definition of the different types of strokes. So we have strokes that are caused by a clot. We have strokes that are caused by a bleed or a rupture. Brand new statistics, 95%, I'm sorry, 85. 85% of all strokes are caused by a clot. That clot either formed in the brain or it traveled to the brain. That's why we try to get you up and get you moving. Anytime you have surgery, we're worried you're gonna develop a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis, a blood clot. Usually forms in the leg, travels, we say you throw it, travels to either the lungs, the heart, or the brain. Any one of those can kill you. So 85% of strokes are that clot. 15% are the bleed, the rupture, um, the oozing of blood, the aneurysm. What an aneurysm is, it's a weakness on the wall of an artery, kind of like a little bubble that forms, and it just fills and fills and fills with blood and eventually pops. I talk about the 15% with the same importance as the 85%, because these are the ones that kill you. This is 52% of the deaths. 15% of the strokes, 52% of the deaths. So this is PowerPoint led. Do I have to point this? Just click it. Dang. All right. So signs and symptoms. This should say signs and symptoms. So a sign is something you see, and a symptom is something they have to tell you. So signs and symptoms of a stroke. So sudden numbness or weakness, half the face, an arm, or a leg. If the stroke happens on this side of the brain, the brain is divided. So if the stroke happens on this side of the brain, it affects exactly this half of the face. The nerves crisscross kind of back here. So not uncommon if I've got the weakness in this side of the face, I would see the weakness in the opposite arm or the opposite leg. Not always, but statistically. Sudden confusion, sudden trouble speaking. If the stroke's in the part of the brain that controls the speech, these people throw words together that make no sense. Like the words don't even belong together, just gibberish. Sudden trouble um, seeing. If it was this side of the brain and it affected this eye, or this side of the brain, it affected this eye, there would be a black spot right in the middle of their vision field. Like the vision would be out around the black spot. Sudden trouble walking, their balance is off, they're dizzy. Um, sudden severe headache, this crush, crushing headache. You've got nine lobes of the brain. Four here, four here, and the brain stem. So it depends what lobe of the, of the brain the stroke is in, depends on what your signs and symptoms are gonna be. One person isn't gonna have all of those. They might only have one. But what remains constant is that first word. Something that wasn't there a second ago. Any type of sudden neurological change, you're gonna be suspect that it could be a stroke. My statistics. This is in the United States. 795,000 people every year in this country have a stroke. Every 40 seconds, somebody has one. Every four minutes, somebody dies. And only 38% of people knew what the signs and symptoms were, knew it was a 911 call. 
the number one cause of strokes is ignored high blood pressure. Yeah, I know I've got it. Something's got to kill me. Uh, you know, that's kind of the what we hear. Um, ignored or undiagnosed. I don't go to the doctor. I don't want to know. Or under medicated. If you've got high blood pressure and you're controlling it, yes, that's what you need to do. But if you are not controlling that high blood pressure and that pressure builds and builds and builds, you are a ticking time bomb. Pretend I've got a rubber band around my hand. All right, your heart working, your heart relaxing. Your heart working, your heart relaxing. Your arteries filling up with blood, pushing that blood back out. This is how we measure your blood pressure. Top number is called systolic, bottom number is called diastolic. We flip out when the bottom number is above 90, because what does that mean? Your heart's never relaxing, your arteries are never emptying, plaque builds up. You can call it plaque, you can call it cholesterol, you can call it fat. It builds up inside the artery and the blood pressure goes higher and higher and higher. And now the body's freaking out. The body's like, I know I have to open this pressure valve. It is not uncommon at all for an adult to pop a nosebleed. Anytime I have an adult come to me and say, yeah, I don't know what happened. My nose just started bleeding. Yeah, you have high blood pressure, don't you? How'd you know that? Because you just popped a nosebleed and you don't know why. You'd better say thank you to your body. Because if it popped here, what happened to that pressure? And if it didn't pop here, where's it popping? 15% of the strokes, 52% of the deaths. The best trick I can give you, if you've got high blood pressure and you're having trouble controlling it, is to become a blood donor. Your body doesn't know the difference if you lost these copious amounts of blood from the nosebleed or if you lost the blood through donating a bag of it. The body now has to make new blood to make up for what you've lost. And every time the body makes new blood to make up for what you've lost, it lowers that blood pressure. Little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit. So it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. It's something if you commit to doing, you have to stay committed to. You're probably looking at a good year and a half, two years of donating to really make a big difference. I don't know, to me it's win-win. Donate blood and get off your blood pressure meds. It has to be with your doctor's supervision because they're the ones that are gonna reduce the amount of your blood pressure medication as your blood pressure drops. Does that make sense? The Any blood donation center will take your blood every 56 days. They have it down to a science. It's not like come back in two months, no. They want to put you on the books for 56 days from now. I, I have lost track of the number of people over the years that I've been selling, that I've been sharing this, that have, have done it and successfully. Um, our main client that we teach first aid and CPR to is Milton Hershey School. I had a house dad come in two weeks ago bowing, bowing. And I'm like, Calvin, what is going on? He said, I think you walk on water. I'm like, why? He said, it's been a year and a half, Miss Eileen. I am totally off my blood pressure medication. It is a cool trick. You have to continue to donate. It has to be with your doctor's supervision. But remain, and if you do it, I wanna know about it. And help me spread the word on it too, okay? All right, um, women over the age of 65, so that birthday two days ago was number 76. I can't believe I'm that old. But I am, I am. So thank you. I still meet with about 18 of my high school girlfriends. We get together once a month. It's kind of cool. There's no cliques anymore. Yeah, it's kind of like all that drama is gone. Um, but that's the conversation we have. Like if we would have known we were going to live this long, we would have taken better care of ourselves. And like we're trying to do it now. I started boxing four years ago. I'm trying to make up for all the years I didn't. So I get that 28% drop. But look at the bottom line. We have seen this huge spike in young people with stroke, 44% increase. We know why. Youngins, listen to me and help me educate your age group because one of the reasons is vaping. One of the reasons is vaping. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, the other is energy drinks. Do you ever have an energy drink? Like a five hour energy? Oh my word. One time, 
once and done. We were doing a double class. We were teaching in the morning. We had to go teach in the afternoon. I was dragging. I said to my husband, pull into the Turkey Hill. I'm going to grab a five-hour energy. I thought my heart was going to come out my chest. 260 milligrams of caffeine in that. Look, your body can't handle that. Now, a cup, a cup, one to three cups a day of coffee is good. It helps to regulate your heartbeat, keeps it regular. There's nothing wrong in moderation. It's these big hits that the monster drinks and the five-hour energies have. Your body can't sustain it. 44% increase in strokes. So there are risk factors. Some of these are genetic. Some of these you're stuck with. Some of these are lifestyle choices. Atrial fibrillation. So the atrium is the top two chambers of your heart. What the atrium does, it empties the blood into the ventricles. There are valves there. If one or both of those chambers flutter or fibrillate, all of the blood does not empty into the ventricles, lays in the bottom of the chamber, and forms clots. What's 85% of all strokes? Clot. You have a five-time higher risk of having a stroke if you are diagnosed with AFib. You must control it. High blood pressure, we just talked about. Obesity, of course, um, being stationary, doesn't help. Smoking, your body does not know the difference between first-hand smoke or second-hand smoke. First-hand smoke, you're the smoker. Second-hand smoke, you are inhaling their exhaled smoke. Your lungs see it the exact same way. You will have the exact same damage to your lungs as the smoker. High cholesterol, I am going to show you... Um, I'm going to show you a slide in a minute on that. Diabetes. If you have diabetes and you are not controlling the high blood sugar, the excess blood sugar in your bloodstream whittles away at the lining of your blood vessels in your brain. Diabetics get an oozing of blood in the brain. Diabetics have a 50% higher risk of having a stroke because of that. Family history. This is huge. So Penn State um, Med Center has a stroke trauma team that tries to educate the public on stroke, just like I'm trying to do right now. They claim that if you have an immediate family member that has had a stroke, they describe immediate family member as mother, father, full brother, full sister. The day they had their stroke, your risk level jumped 50%. They also state if you have two family members that have had a stroke, you should be checked immediately. Now, my question would be, does that family member have comorbidities? So a comorbidity is something that leads to a premature death. Are they diabetic? You're not. Do they have AFib? You don't. Do they smoke? You don't. Those are all comorbidities. That has to play a part as well. Heart disease, of course. Um, anytime, anytime any major organs are damaged, it does not lead to proper blood flow. Blood flow doesn't get to the brain. That can be um, an, a reason as well. Heavy alcohol use. Oh, you guys are going to love this one. So <laughs> this study was done on people that saved their drinking for their days off. And if they had four drinks in a two-hour period, it put such a strain on their body that they had strokes. So my message is drink all week. <laughs> just, just keep drinking, right? All right. <laughs> Here's the deal on vaping. Vaping should scare you. First of all, vaping is not regulated by anybody. Nobody regulates it. There can be anything in those cartridges. We had a guy share with us in a CPR class a couple of weeks ago that he was at a vape store buying cartridges and a car pulled up, popped the trunk, got out this tray of cartridges he had made in his garage and sold them to the shop owner to turn around and sell. No idea what's in them. We are seeing something medically. If any of you know any respiratory therapist, ask them about what's happening. There is something called popcorn lung. So in your lungs, you have these alveoli that are grape-like clusters that allow for the oxygen exchange. What happens, the damage from all the chemicals that are in vape pens makes them like explode and they look like pieces of popcorn and cannot exchange the air. We are going to have young people on oxygen 24 seven. In the next five years, the results of this are gonna be horrific. Um, they target our elementary kids. 
they target our middle division kids because they figure once they have them hooked, they have them for life. There didn't used to be nicotine in. Now they're adding nicotine. They want more people hooked. And do you know they make them that they look like a USB port? You think your kid has a USB port. You think they have a highlighter. You think they have a tube of lipstick. And it's a vape pen. It's crazy. Crazy, crazy. All right, some unique signs of stroke in women. I will let you read down through this. I want to talk about the bottom one, migraines with auras. So not that you men can't get migraines because you certainly can. It is more female oriented just because of the hormonal factor. All right, a migraine. So you get, there's this band of ligaments that comes up over your brain. The cluster starts back here at the back of the brain and these fingers for lack of a better word, go up over your brain. And then migraine, what happens? They squeeze the brain. That's what causes all the pain. If that, if that migraine has lasted longer than 12 hours, it has reduced blood flow so significantly the clots form. The, the stroke, I have to think a minute, the, the medical term is migraineous infarction. It is a stroke that's induced by a prolonged migraine. I have a trick for that too, of course. There's a product out there called Biofreeze. If you are getting migraines, get yourself a tube, roll on spray of Biofreeze. And as soon as that migraine's starting, rub it at the base of your neck. It'll help. If you suspect a stroke, you need to go to a designated or comprehensive stroke center. The three that are in red are one of 2% of hospitals nationwide that are considered the creme de la creme for strokes. One of those is Penn State Hershey you have a 30% higher return to quality of life post-stroke if you go to a designated stroke center. This is why. I should add, if you're not in the area, if you're not in the area, you're on vacation, whatever, on your cell phone, just Google stroke center. And the first option that you'll get will be near me. Boom, that's where you wanna go. You have a 30% 30, 30 higher return to quality of life. This is why. At the designated or comprehensive stroke center, all the tests have to be done in a timely manner. They have to be read within a timely manner. The third bullet, talking about TPA. TPA is a clot-busting drug. They will give you TPA if your heart attack's caused by a clot. They will give you TPA if your stroke is caused by a clot. But they can't assume, because 85% of all clots are a stroke, you show up with signs and symptoms and automatically give you the TPA intravenously, because if you're a bleed, and they've given you that, you're going to bleed to death. So they have to do all the testing first to determine which you are before they treat. This breaks it down. You have to be seen by a doctor within 10 minutes. If you are ever at any of these hospitals, you will hear them calling the stroke team over the PA system. They'll call them stroke team to room so-and-so, stroke team to room so-and-so. I was at the new Penn State Hospital two weeks ago down in Lancaster across from Kellogg's. And they called brain attack, um, brain attack emergency room, room 2211 is what they called. And I thought, gee, that's kind of scarier sounding than stroke team, isn't it? But I don't know if that's what they're going to switch to. But you have to be seen by the doctor within 10 minutes. They have to start your CAT scan within 15. CAT scan's done quickly. That's what's going to determine if you're the, the, um, the clot or the bleed. When that CAT scan is done, it has to be read or interpreted within 20 minutes. Now they're 45 minutes into this. They know if you're the clot or the bleed, they're going to treat accordingly. The IV TPA is running into your veins within an hour, or you're on the OR table in under two. If you go by ambulance, your percentage of back to quality of life jumps to 50%. Here's why. First of all, the ambulance personnel are going to know where to take you. The magic happens when they get you there. They take you straight from the litter of the ambulance, straight to the CAT scan machine. They don't even take you into the ED, ER, whatever you want to call it. You bypass that. They take you straight from the litter, straight to the CAT scan machine. So if this is all bumped up 15 minutes, time is brain. The quicker they can diagnose, the quicker they can treat, the less damage you have for the rest of your life. Um, stroke is one of the top 10 causes of childhood deaths. This one blew me away. 
So 7,000 kids a year have a stroke. Most of them are infants. So what's going on? Not every state requires that infants have their blood pressure taken. What? Pennsylvania only mandated it in 2017 that every newborn has to have their blood pressure taken. If you can eliminate that bottom sentence, why would it even have to be a law? So if you've got a new baby in the household, you want to know what that blood pressure is because that's inexcusable. The other thing that happens often, the mom will throw a clot, a piece of plaque will break off during delivery and it will pass through the umbilical cord to the infant. So that's part of part of that. What am I looking for? I'm looking for the kid that pops the nosebleeds. I'm looking for the kid that pops the sudden headaches. And I'm not saying, not saying every nosebleed in a young child is blood pressure related. Maybe they're causing the trauma. Maybe the air's too dry in your household. That's a big trigger, especially the younger we are, the closer to the surface of the skin the blood vessels are. Some of you may have struggled with nosebleeds as a child, and you say you outgrew it. You didn't really outgrow it. What happened is you got older, the mucous membranes got thicker, and it just buried those blood vessels deeper. It was harder for them to crack and bleed. I've got a trick for that too. If you have a kid that's popping nosebleeds before they go to bed at night, a little bit of coconut oil on the end of a Q-tip, moisten up the mucous membranes. What they really need is a humidifier, but you could try the coconut oil first. Only one out of 10 people recover. One out of 10. That's almost like unheard of nowadays. Four out of 10 have some type of permanent disability for the rest of their lives. It is the most debilitating disease that we have. So what can you do to help? So other than those lifestyle things, Anything that's high in vitamin E or omega-3s helps to keep your blood vessels elastic. Anything that's high in fiber helps to scrub the junk out of your arteries. So your oatmeal, your fruit with the skins on it, your vegetables, anything high fiber helps with that. Um, and the nuts, it's not peanuts and cashews, darn it. It's all the other ones. So um, Brazil nuts, if you would eat three Brazil nuts a day, there's a ton of selenium. There's a lot of benefits to Brazil nuts, macadamia, hazelnuts, walnuts, almonds, those kind of nuts. And I told you earlier, right, coffee, coffee in moderation is good for you. One to three cups a day is fine. It helps to keep your heartbeat regular, helps to stimulate that. There's nothing wrong with one to three. It's the abuse. And it's like everything else in our lives, right? It's the 80-20, kind of that 80-20, that balance. Like today I came here and made up my mind I was going to get a salad. Well, I didn't get the salad, but I got me a chocolate chip cookie. So, <laughs> uh, If you suspect a stroke, the Heart Association says FAST, face arm speech, speech time. The stroke trauma team at the Med Center says if you add B to it, B fast, if their balance is off, if you look at their pupils, so the pupil is the dark part of your eyes, they are supposed to be equal. If one's dilated and one's constricted, they're not equal. That is a sign. If you ask them to smile, remember when I said that stroke affects exactly half the face? Ask them to smile. Maybe this side comes up in the smile and this side doesn't and droops. That's a sign. You're going to ask them to extend their arms and raise them. They might be able to do that initially. If they've got a weakness, they won't be able to sustain it that other arm will start to drop. One of the things I've done all the way back to nursing days, all the way back to the mid 60s, if I suspected you were having a stroke, I got you to squeeze my fingers. I wanted to feel if your grip was as strong on this side as it was on this side. Heart Association made that part of the protocol that I teach in 2022. I've been doing it since 67. I wanna feel your grip. I'm gonna ask you to talk to me. Remember when I said that line goes right down the center of the face? It goes right through half the tongue. So it's not like I'm not going to understand what you're saying, but those words are going to be garbled or slurred. If they have two of those five, balances off, pupils aren't equal, face drooping, weakness in the arms or in the grip, slurred speech, two of those five, it is a 94% likelihood it's a stroke. It is a 911 call. The T, that's the time. Yes, it's almost every instructor will tell you 
to call 911. That's what the T means. And yes, I'm going to tell you that too, but what is more important, well, just let me go back to my first one. Oh, that's cool. So I got to go, okay. <laughs> I'd love to. So, okay, get me back to my very first one. Cool. What you have got to know is the time of the sudden onset of the symptoms. You know, typically when you're any type of medical, yes, thank you. Typically what they ask you is name, name, date of birth, name, date of birth, name, date of birth, not with this. All everybody is asking you is what time did the symptoms begin? What time did the symptoms begin? The FDA will only allow that IV TPA to be given to 85% of patients whose stroke is caused by the clot in the first four and a half hours from the sudden onset of the symptoms. If you cannot tell them what time the symptoms started and their stroke is caused by a clot, they will not get that TPA. The FDA said there's no benefit after four hours, the damage is already done. That's the person that you see that can't use an arm or can't use a leg. Never got the TPA, the stroke, the, the clot stayed there long enough to do the permanent damage. So you've got to know the time. And in that four and a half hours is the transport, all the testing, all of that has to be within that four and a half hour window. What do we do? You know, and I noticed this myself, like, you know, at 76, like sometimes I wake up in the morning and it's like, I didn't have that when I went to bed last night. What is that? So, you know, we kind of think, oh, maybe if we go back to bed, it'll go away. And that's what happens. You miss the window. You miss the window. You know your body better than anybody else. Pay attention. Remember that be fast, all right? And if you've got high blood pressure and you choose to start donating blood, I want to know about it. Thank you for being here. Olivia, Derek, you give me hope for the future. So thank you. Glenn. Oh, Glenn wants to talk. Remember when you go and they want to 